First, I would like to apologize for being somewhat late. Apparently, getting this takes a little bit longer than I thought. But I also would like to begin with thanking uh, Mr. Mark Donfried, uh, the director and the founder of the Institute of Cultural Diplomacy, for the invitation to speak here. And I think for the initiatives you do so well, because as you pointed out, I think it's very important that we continue working on um, cross-cultural and cross-transcontinental uh, cross uh, trans communications and developments. Uh, as you said, Azerbaijan pays a special attention to that. As we speak now, I think yesterday was the last panel and the concluding event of the Baku Humanitarian Forum, which is an annual event. Uh, it's a major event. I think they brought together almost a thousand people from all over the world uh, to discuss humanitarian issues from environment to cross-cultural communication to healthcare to all of those things, which I think is, uh, is very important for us. And in fact, uh, when we spoke, when I spoke last year at this event, we had a, I, will, and I, I then announced that there will be a, a, a conference on cross-cultural uh, multiculturalism in Azerbaijan. And it, the second time Azerbaijan had this conference on intercultural dialogue and interfaith dialogue, which I think is very important. Once again, we bring together the major religious leaders from all over the world and most civic leaders to discuss how do we move forward. I, uh, I am not a lawyer by education, and though I spent a lot of time with the lawyers and uh, tried to be careful with them, but I tried to spend a lot of time with them. But I will be speaking a bit about international law. The reason is because as for Azerbaijan, the matter of international law is a matter of utmost importance. I'll tell you why. On October 21st, 2011, Azerbaijan, for the first time, was elected as a non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, which is, of course, the highest body of international law, basically a major uh, crisis management institution in the world. For the period of 2012-2013, uh, Azerbaijan has been a member. Um, it's a major achievement for a nation which, is, which at that time was only 20 years old as an independent state. Uh, I mean, in the form of Soviet Union, Azerbaijan, with the exception of Ukraine, became the first member, uh, non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. But you have to remember that Ukraine was a member of UN even under the Soviet, uh, under the Soviet Union. Azerbaijan just concluded this October its second time its presidency of the United Nations Security Council. And two things with it which is very important. The first time Azerbaijan assumed presidency of the United Nations Security Council, it was in, um, uh, it was in May of 2012. Uh, and the key subject, the topic of the conversation then, uh, or the meetings presided by President Aliyev, who attended the event, was on fighting terrorism and radicalism in the world. So imagine, here's a country which is 20 years old, takes on the presidency of the United Nations Security Council, and right away, the first subject that deals with is a major challenge facing the humanity today, that's uh, terrorism. This year, in October, Azerbaijan also chaired the uh, United Nations Security Council, and our main topic this year has been um, the dialogue between the United Nations Security Council and the Organization of uh, Islamic Cooperation. Think about it. As organization of Islamic Cooperation, after UN, is the largest international organization. We, uh, many of the challenges facing the current uh, international environment actually take place either with participation or in the Muslim nations around the world. But there had never been a direct communication between UNSC, United Nations Security Council, and the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, which is a major grouping of the Muslim states around the world. So for the first time, it came to the Republic of Azerbaijan to bring those two organizations together to sit down and initiate a dialogue. We hope that dialogue will, be, uh, will take a regular, um, very regular and ongoing uh, nature, and it will continue to happen even when Azerbaijan leaves its uh, non-permanent seat at the end of the year 2013. Azerbaijan, despite, for, it's an interesting two-way street. Despite uh, being a young nation in many ways, we have, I think, contributed quite a lot in accordance with international law to the work of the United Nations Security Council. And of course, for us, it's been a great capacity building, uh, capacity building exercise and, uh, and a, great, um, a great learning experience. But what is the United Nations Security Council? I mean, it's, most of us hear about that. We don't always know what it is. 
Obviously, it's a principal crisis management, by, crisis management uh, body of the United Nations empowered to impose binding obli uh, obligations on all member states. Um, in a way, it is the most powerful and the highest body of interstate relationship. It's also almost a very tough situation for anybody who falls under the jurisdiction of the United Nations Security Council, and in fact, most of the nations around the world do fall under that jurisdiction, because if you're one of the 93, 193 members of the United Nations, the decisions made by the United Nations Security Council are binding. There is no recourse, there is no appellate system. Decision is made, you have to fall. The, I mean, it's sometimes even difficult to imagine that that exists, but it is actually. Uh, it is, um, that's how it works. It's 15 members. We have uh, P5 permanent members, China, France, the, United, the Russian Federation, United Kingdom, and the United States, which can veto decisions. And uh, 10, 10 uh, non-permanent members elected for, 10, 10, uh, for two year terms. And of course, presidents rotates among all of them, 15 members. It's interesting that during the Cold War era, most of the decisions of the United Nations Security Council, which focus on enforcing international law, military interventions, protections of peace and security, have not actually been implemented very, or invoked very often, simply because it would be very difficult to expect during the, uh, during the Cold War that the Soviet Union or the United States or the China or France would agree with each other. But after the collapse of the Soviet Union, after the end of the Cold War, we've seen an upsurge of decision making and upsurge of the using of the peacekeeping operations quite significantly. In fact, uh, the most visible face of the United Nations Security Council is the peacekeeping operations. Uh, in 2013, the Council was overseeing 16 operations and 97,000 uniformed personnel. Now, think if you step back, think about that. Uh, all the conspiracies about the international government becomes uh, becomes almost vivid here. You could make a movie about that if you want to. Um, 16 operations and 97,000 uniformed personnel. That's quite a lot of uh, people and a lot of effort. We have seen some very interesting cases uh, of the United Nations intervention. I mean, um, look at what happened in Kosovo, for instance. The United Nations the Security Council never authorized the Kosovo operation. N NATO, which includes uh, major, um, uh, major powers, including the three members of the three members of the of P5, the permanent members of the uh, of the Security Council, has used force against Serbia vis-à-vis -vis, uh, vis -vis Kosovo. Now, it's a very contentious issue because. Um, when the NATO's operation in Kosovo came up for review in international legal bodies, International Court of Justice and all this, it actually came up to an interesting conclusion. I am, I'm still puzzled by that. I'm still puzzled by that term. Well, Mr. Dolphin, maybe you could explain that to me, what it means. Um, an independent commission of scholars said that intervention was illegal, but legitimate. I don't know exactly what that means. Uh, but it actually means that uh, we don't want to endorse it, but since you did it anyway, we will accept the outcome. The United Nations Security Council exists as a derivative, derivative of the international law, but it also is an author of international law because its decisions are absolute and have to be followed. We have seen different cases when it's stalled. I mean, the two most obvious cases recently have been Libya, where the members of the Security Council agreed, basically, and acquiesced on de facto overthrow the gov of the government of Libya, a Libyan government, and using force to um, impose, impose military action in Libya. Yet, the same very Security Council failed to come in an agreement to an agreement on a military action vis-a-vis -vis Syria. Which brings us to an important point. Security Council decisions are effective and move forward when there is a certain degree of consensus among the major powers, the P5. When there is no degree of consensus, then of course, uh, it's very difficult to expect the United Nations Security Council to come to an agreement. And that's where we have a very serious problem. 
Because when the nation states, and especially the major powers such as P5, do not want to fulfill their obligations before the international community as members of the uh, United Nations Security Council, you create a vacuum where the decisions have to be made anyway, but then they basically have to be termed in a way that the scholars term the Kosovo operation, which becomes illegal but legitimate and creates a certain degree of question whether this is actually a very good way to move forward. Uh, we, uh, Azerbaijan has its own relationship with the United Nations Security Council, which comes from 1992-1993, uh, very early years of Azerbaijan and Azerbaijan's independence. And we've been on a, both the receiving side of the attention and consensus of the United Nations Security Council, as well as uh, on the receiving side of indecision by the United Nations Security Council. For instance, in reference to the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict over the region of Nagorno-Karabakh of the Republic of Azerbaijan, which was uh, occupied by the armed forces of the Republic of Armenia, in, a, in a response to that conflict and to the illegal actions of the Armenian military, United Nations Security Council adopted resolutions 822 in 1993, 853 in 1993 as well, 874 in 1993, and 884 uh, in 1993 again. These resolutions reaffirming the respect for the sovereignty, territorial integrity, and inviolability of the international borders of Azerbaijan demanded immediate, complete, and unconditional withdrawal of occupying forces from all occupied regions of the Republic of Azerbaijan. That's an interesting case. For the, this, the Soviet Union collapses, our nations uh, emerge as independent states. 1992, 1993, imagine, two years since independence. For the first time, the United Nations Security Council's powers, as well, in this particular case, it was France, Russia, and and the United States come to an agreement that the degree of occupation and humanitarian suffering is unacceptable uh, for the international community. It poses a clear uh, threat to peace and security in the region. So they adopt these resolutions. The resolutions are absolutely absolute for, uh, in terms of implementation. They have to be implemented. There is no, again, once again, a recourse going back and forth. However, however, the resolutions the four resolutions by the United Nations Security Council have been ignored and are still being ignored by Armenia and uh, the Armenian government. That's, that's quite unique. Imagine it would be enough to come to a consensus to one somewhat vaguely worded resolution on Syria to begin a war vis-a-vis -a, -vis a sovereign nation in 2013. It was enough to have a vaguely stated resolution to have a war in Iraq. It's, again, was quite vaguely stated resolution vis-a-vis -vis Libya, which allowed for a military action vis-a-vis -vis the Gaddafi government. Yet four resolutions clearly stating four resolutions. I mean, if anybody, if any government of P5 would have four resolutions responding to their concern, trust me, they would, would begin a World War III by now. And that's what we have. We have four resolutions calling for the withdrawal of the troops from the territories of Azerbaijan. Yet, absolute silence, no interest, and total ignoration. So why is it so? And it comes to the point when international law apparently does not seem to be absolute. International law comes in terms of, you know, you know what George Orwell said, we're all equal, but some people are more equal than others. That, is, that seems to be an interesting example in international law. You know, we, our foreign minister, El Mamadiyev, likes to joke about this. We remember during the Soviet Union, we had this joke when people come up and say, do I have a right? They said, yes, you do have a right, but you don't have a right to exercise it. Uh, and that's an interesting example. Now, why this, why this is dangerous? The realities of international politics show that, of course, the Republic of Azerbaijan is not a strong enough country and not a large enough country to impose its decision-making or views on the rest of the, uh, of the international community, nor are we willing to do that. But Azerbaijan came, up, uh, came into the international community with a certain degree of almost naive perception that international law matters. Why? Because if international law doesn't matter, then what matters is perforce might make sense, right. but then 
that makes a perception. That is based on the perception that your mind is permanent and stable. But that mind changes. The same nations which today ignore the international law may end up in a situation where there is only the only recourse to future stability will be international law. Azerbaijan is often accused of many things. We're on the receiving side of uh, many accusations. But think about that. Having the right under the four Security Council resolutions, having the right enshrined in annual United Nations General Assembly uh, resolutions, having the right under, under UN chapter, Article 51, to defend its own territory. Azerbaijan has not used a military force. There is an issue there why we don't use it. We actually know that we have a right to use it. We overstate that we have a right to use it. But there is a reason why we don't use it. Because we believe and we hope that international law by itself works. What our neighbors in Armenia don't understand, if you violate the law once because you feel, felt at the moment that you're stronger and you have a backing of a bigger nation, that strength clearly evaporates, and by now it's clear that Azerbaijan is much stronger than Armenia, there's no question there. And the support of a bigger nation may evaporate. And once it happens, your only hope is international law. So what Azerbaijan is thinking is, let us observe the law. Let us not, uh, for instance, the question of Kosovo, I, I understand the aspirations of the, uh, of the Kosovo Albanians, and I understand the humanitarian issue. But there are ways to solve this issue which would not damage and would not set precedence for future negative developments. And those, are, those things are important. We have seen uh, a fallout of those situations in the, in the Middle East. We've seen the fallout of those situations in the Caucasus vis-a-vis -vis Georgia. So I think those are important factors to remember. So international law as today is seen very much as, an, uh, as a tool to advance a national or specific interest of a particular power, which is understandable. That's logical. However, it might be too much to expect, but isn't that the very basis of the United Nations? That we look at the international law as having value on its own, because in the long term, it's in our own interest for all of us. In fact, for Azerbaijan, for Armenia, for Russia, for the United States, for everybody to observe that law, and set a precedent of following the law in a way as we do in our own lives. I mean, if you enter a bank, you would, if you rob a bank, you would get more money, of course, in the short term. But when you get in, out in the street, you want to make sure that nobody robs you and there is enough law and order around. So, I mean, this, just as we do in our own lives, we want to protect it in the international community as well. I think those are um, very important elements for us, and the Republic of Azerbaijan has always, since its very inception as independent state in uh, 1991, has been looking at the international law and to the United Nations Security Council as a body which will, at the end of the day, observe uh, law and order and would uphold justice vis-a-vis -vis, uh, violations of international law. Now, before I conclude, I, Mr. Dunford, I wanted once again to to commend the work the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy is doing. And there's a reason, a uh, very, very positive reason, why this work is so important. Cultural diplomacy, uh, Azerbaijan takes a very specific and very keen role on that in international affairs. What we understand is that very often, um, we don't understand each other around the world. We all have the stereotypes which say, look, you look a certain way, you have a certain skin color, you belong to a certain religion, you come from a different ethnicity. And, and it's so easy to fall victims to those stereotypes. We've seen that throughout history. And unfortunately, unfortunately, we see it now today. I mean, it, it hurts me to say I, I went to school in, uh, in, Moscow, in Moscow. I'm a graduate of Moscow State University. But it is today in Moscow, the city where I grew up, uh, went to school and where was the capital of the Soviet Union to which we all belonged. Today you have people organizing de facto pogroms of people who look differently. Azerbaijan is today, there was just yesterday the case of an Azerbaijani teenager being 
and handicapped Azerbaijani teenager being beaten up on a, on a bus in, in, in Russia for one reason and one reason only, because that guy was simply happened to be an Azerbaijani. A little bit darker, a little bit darker hair, maybe somewhat black eyes and stuff like that. That's enough to be beaten up. In the 21st century, or in fact in any century, those kind, that kind of behavior is unacceptable. And part of the problem here is that, we, that the cultural stereotypes need to be broken. And uh, I think you're doing a great job in that respect. I think uh, it is very important. We often focus today, Azerbaijan, as a, as a country which stands at the crossroads of so many cultures and so many cultural systems, and especially being a, in a, a European, having a European identity, having an element of Islamic identity, uh, standing at the crossroads of where it is. We take great pride in bringing all religions, cultures, and especially the Muslims and non-Muslims together. I, while we focused on that agenda, we almost ignored a very small thing, which it would seem to have. We would never imagine that the hair, the color of your hair, um, would be a danger for you in a neighboring state, which we lived for centuries next to each other, just in a bus. So. I think there's a lot, a lot to be done, and it's, uh, I think those are the concerns which we still need to be addressing. Um, again, I'm sorry if I spoke for too long. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have.